it's my pleasure once again to introduce Professor Roberts. Um, he's the head of the Life Science Center here, certainly one of the most distinguished members of the faculty at, at MU, he's curator's professor, uh, member of the National Academy, uh, and uh, does research on animal, uh, animal reproduction. Um, so, Dr. Roberts, welcome. What I'm going to do this week um, is, uh, it is a separate lecture from the one last week, so, um, you know, but you'll notice that some of the slides at the beginning are the same. And I'm doing this deliberately because I know that several people uh, could not attend last week's, and so I'm going to give uh, a rather rapid run-through of some of the things I covered then. Uh, I apologize, but it will have to be relatively quickly or we won't be able to get onto the issues uh, for this week's talk, which I'd really like to emphasize. And in this, I'm going to be talking about the more problematic aspects of embryo stem cells, some of the political and ethical issues associated with their use. And I do uh, welcome uh, anyone in the audience to either break in. Uh, we, can, we will have, of course, uh, questions at the end. Uh, we're not restricted to uh, leave here at 11 o'clock if people want to, uh, sorry, 11.30 if people want to talk. Last week we did have the football game as a competition, which made things a little tough. Uh, but um, I'll be through uh, well before the hour's over, um, unless we get into a sort of heated debate during the talk. But uh, I would like to have the um, uh, people in the audience to sort of give their views. And what I'm going to be saying today is um, driven, is not, I'm not trying to take any particular stance on stem cells, although you'll probably sense uh, a flavor of my views. Um, but and this is, doesn't also mean that uh, there aren't contrasting views uh, and that, there is, uh, that these contrasting views should be honored. And this is why, again, I showed this slide. The ultimate good is best reached by free trade in ideas. And I, I like to think that the Saturday morning series contributes to this philosophy. Um, again, these are human embryonic stem cells that were grown in my laboratory by my colleague, Dr. Toshihiko Ezashi. Um, they're uh, small and differentiated with a large nucleus and a small cytoplasmic volume. Um, as long as you grow them under the right conditions, they maintain themselves in an undifferentiated state. That is, they don't progress to other, t uh, other more differentiated tissue types which we would encounter in the human body. Uh, but again, what's all the fuss about? And uh, I guess this is going to be the emphasis today of this, uh, uh, of this lecture. And I showed this. Um, again, several uh, last time, and it really shows, um, you know, the more extreme views, you know, tissue, organ parts for, for sale, babies in test tubes, a yes to human cloning, which I think by scientific standards is an absurd thing to support, but, uh, and the embryonic stem cells here, but of course, uh, uh, the cloning issue comes into this, and I'll talk about that uh, at some length as we go on, because cloning, and embryonic stem cell research, to some extent, have become inexorably linked, although that needn't uh, necessarily be the case um, uh, for all aspects of the research. And again, to remind you that a stem is the main body or stalk of a plant or the stock of a family lineage, and uh, that, they, in other words, they are the basis that upon which uh, all other cells of the body are derived. Ultimately, we start out as beings, as a single cell, a zygote, which is results from a fusion of an oocyte and a sperm. This goes through a series of cleavage divisions, if you recall, and ultimately we get a placenta and we get a fetus, and eventually we end up with a baby. Uh, I say we in a very general human sense, but... Um, the, uh, obviously, there, there is a requirement here of one sex uh, putting more energy into this than the other. But nevertheless, what are stem cells? They have an ability to divide for indefinite number of divisions. I pointed out last week, if I grew some skin cells from you and put them in culture dish, they probably, depending upon how young you were, but they would probably go through about 50 or 60 divisions and then would uh, stop. They would uh, die. 
stem cells will divide indefinitely as long as their chromosome complement is maintained. And cells do tend to lose chromosomes and so on. But they, they, that in general, though, stem cells are very stable in this regard. They can repair themselves. They can give rise to more specialized cells when they differentiate. And I pointed out that there are really three types of stem cell. Uh, uh, the unipotent lineage specific, that is the precursor of a red blood cell, uh, is a precursor of a red blood cell and not of a white blood cell. Uh, we have the adult stem cells, which are multipotent. They will be further down the lineage and can give rise to more than uh, a single uh, end cell. And then, of course, the cells we're most concerned about here, the embryonic stem cells, which are pluripotent and can give rise to all the cells, different cell types of the body. And I illustrated this in the form of this tree, whereby uh, here we have, if you like, the stem, we have the uh, embryo, the oocyte, the cleavage of this four cell to a morula, which is this ball of cells, to a blastocyst. And that ultimately these are uh, the source of most embryonic stem cells, the so-called inner cell mass of the embryo. And that we have these branches coming out. In, and up here we would have the unipotent cells uh, giving rise just the tips of the branch, the, uh, the, uh, the ones that are multipotent, if you like, giving rise to several types of mature cell. And the stem cells themselves here, precursors of all these other cell types. And I, I pointed out that um, if we look at the human body, which has over 10 trillion cells, even in the adult, uh, there are cells that continue to divide and proliferate and can give rise to um, th uh, more mature cells in the bone marrow, in the intestine, and in the hair, and even in the brain. There are cells which have this potential to divide and to give rise to more differentiated cells and in theory replace uh, cells that may be damaged um, or in some way or, or, or aged. But certainly this capacity to self-renew um, uh, becomes less as the organism, as the human, for example, ages. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. I also pointed out that stem cells uh, lived in a particular environment which contributed to their ability to maintain this stemness, if you like. And they give rise um, themselves to progenitor cells which are also dividing rapidly, but which have an infinite half-life. Li uh, in other words, these have to be replaced at some time by these. And then we go on to these precursor cells and ultimately differentiate itself. So this would be the situation, for example, in the bone marrow, where we have a few stem cells which are precursors of all the different types of cell that are found in the blood. These give rise to some progenitors. And these precursor cells now are already committed to a certain lineage. And then in the end, you get the differentiated cells that are the red blood cell, the white cell, the macrophages, and so on. And uh, unipotent stem cells, it's quite, I mean, uh, uh, intuitive. We have a precursor dividing cell, which will give rise to a number of differentiated end cell. And when we talk about pluripotent, we're talking here about a cell that can give rise to all these different types of cells. So this is pluripotency, and embryonic stem cells are pluripotent. Okay, and we also mentioned the promise of stem cell research, and this has been uh, widely discussed uh, in the press, sometimes in an exaggerated way, sometimes it's been overblown. I mean, I think it's uh, fair to say that the potential has been overblown, and particular scientists are particularly prone to do this. Uh, but nevertheless, what we have here is the pluripotent cell, stem cell. This could be used in a variety of ways, drug development and toxicity tests, because these are very sensitive uh, types of cells. We could also see how these affect development if we're concerned about a drug having an effect, for example, on a, on a pregnancy. Uh, we can look at uh, development and uh, control of gene expression as cells differentiate. But of course, what we're really talking about in the press is this ability to replace damaged cells so that there is a promise of a cure for certain types of chronic di uh, of disease, particularly diseases of aging, but also diseases such as type 1 diabetes, where even early in the existence of a child, the 
uh, cells that produce insulin are destroyed, and they're destroyed actually by the individual's own body. It's an autoimmune response. But there's the hope that these cells could be replaced. So uh, there are real and potential applications of stem cells. Um, we have, uh, of course, the one that we all know about, bone marrow transplantation, in which uh, a patient who has uh, usually been uh, uh, treated by irradiation for a, 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 a proliferative disease of bone marrow can have a, a, his, uh, um, have a bone marrow replacement, either from his or her own cells that have been frozen away or from the cells of another individual who matches that individual in terms of compatibility. And we'll come back to this issue in that graphs, of course, across between individuals occur much more readily between certain types of genetic, uh, uh, if you like, uh, genetic, genetic type of um, uh, character uh, than ones that are very, than individuals are different. And I talked about how, for example, for a, a kidney graft, one has to look around for a suitably matched donor so that that kidney would not be so readily rejected. Uh, but there are these transplantation medicine, like diabetes, Parkinson's disease, stroke, arthritis, uh, heart failure, spinal cord lesions, and so on, and I mentioned drug testing, and even the possibility of genetic change, of altering a gene, putting a correct gene in for one that might be mutated, uh, so that uh, a normalcy can be gained by the transplanted stem cell. And there are other uses that also are there. So, um, and uh, adult stem cells, I mentioned last ti uh, uh, time, uh, uh, undifferentiated cells found in differentiated tissues that can renew itself with certain limitations, differentiate to yield all the specialized cells. And I've, I mentioned again last week that adult cells have also received a lot of hype. There's been the idea that there is no need to pursue research on embryonic stem cells because adult stem cells also have multipotency, possibly even po uh, pluripotency. But I pointed out that uh, most of the research that's shown this has tended to uh, either not being repeatable, sometimes discredited, um, not because the, there was... Um, uh, uh, this w the data were fake, but I think there's been a lot of enthusiasm here and a lot of over-interpretation of results. And right now, I think it's fair to say that the community in general do not believe that adult stem cells can be a substitute for embryonic stem cells for some of the type of tissue replacements we're talking about. Um, and again, embryonic stem cells, these are the primitive undifferentiated cells from the embryo that have the potential to become a wide variety of specialized types. So, uh, let's quickly now start where, we're, try and follow where we're going this week. I pointed out that we have here uh, in, in normal reproduction, a sperm penetrates the egg. And importantly, um, the, uh, the cells of our body tend to be, uh, uh, sorry, are diploid. That is, they have a maternal set of chromosomes and a paternal set of chromosomes. You're a mixture. Each one of us is a product of our parents. Um, gametes, however, arise from a reduction division in which the number of chromosomes is halved, shuffled up by meiosis. Uh, so you get a whole new individual. But so we go with a 23 chromosomes, 23, we get uh, a, a zygote which now has the 46 chromosomes, the normal adult number restored. Uh, these cells divide, we go to a blastocyst. This blastocyst implants into the uterine wall and becomes, uh, the, the outer part here becomes the placenta, the inner part becomes the fetus, which ultimately will develop into the baby. And it's from these cells, as I said, that most embryonic stem cell lines are derived. And these are the cells with this pluripotent, uh, with this pluripotent potential. And when these are uh, cultured appropriately, uh, they will proliferate. The trophoblast cells tend to grow out sideways. These form a little sort of heap in the middle. And in certain circumstances, these can be taken, cultured, and one of those embryonic stem cell lines, similar to the one I showed in my uh, second slide, uh, that Dr. Azashi was culturing. Uh, these are the uh, cell lines that have this potential, if properly directed, to differentiate along certain lineages. And again, uh, they are pluripotent. You've seen this slide before. And again, just to emphasize the potential, uh, 
um, and uh, uh, here the possibility, for example, of using embryonic stem cells suitably directed to form uh, nerve cells uh, can be replaced in rodents and successfully to, to mend or at least partially uh, allow movement, for example, to occur after the um, spinal cord has been severed. And this obviously has huge potential and uh, at least has been demonstrated to be feasible in rodent, both mouse and rat models. Um, so how are uh, human embryonic uh, stem cells uh, prepared? Well, they're prepared from spare, in general, spare IVF embryos. And what do I mean by IVF? IVF is in vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization is used as a technique to, rest uh, to allow uh, a, a couple to have a child uh, where, when otherwise that would be unfeasible. And I'll just talk about this first and talk about some of the issues associated with this. I'm not going to talk about another cat type of uh, ES cell which can be obtained from the precursors of eggs and sperm in the fetus. And these can be obtained from aborted fetuses. Now, uh, to many of us, this would seem a, a repugnant act, but I would like to remind you there may be as many as one million or more terminations of pregnancy um, occurring um, in this country uh, over a, uh, in a relatively short period of time. So I, I say I'm not going to talk about this, but just to say there I this is an alternative source of embryonic stem cells. And some of the cell lines that were established at John Hopkins University were obtained in this way. And essentially, they seem to be almost identical to the ones that are obtained from embryos. Okay, and then lastly, I'm going to, I will talk about therapeutic cloning by somatic nuclear cell transfer, because this is the technique that everybody gets very, uh, shall we say, where everybody has a lot of opinions, particularly uh, politicians. Um, okay, so uh, let's just remind you again that in sexual reproduction, an egg and a sperm fuses. In general, this occurs uh, within the oviduct of the, of the uh, female, uh, but in fact can uh, be carried out quite successfully in a test tube uh, to give an embryo which even in, in, in culture, in the laboratory, uh, in the clinic, can divide quite happily within a few days to give you a blastocyst. So although this normally occurs internally, it can occur externally. And uh, I'd like to show you now, uh, actually two, uh, two, two people I knew quite well, I still do know Bob Edwards quite well. Bob Edwards, Patrick Steptoe, published, uh, obtained the first um, in vitro fertilized, uh, uh, if you like, IVF child back in 1978 in Oldham, England. Uh, Steptoe is a, uh, an obstetrician, gynecologist. Uh, Bob Edwards was an embryologist scientist. And Bob had the idea that this was a way of treating infertility. He teamed up with a, a man who could handle an endoscope and therefore retrieve eggs from a woman fertilized this, uh, these eggs in vitro, returned an embryo to the mother, and uh, that child now is, I think, about 20, what, tw it's around 26, 27 years old. Um, when they did this work and when it was announced, uh, it was incredible. They were vilified by the press. They were taught that they were set to be monsters. They were set to be individuals who were tinkering with nature. The usual things you hear about any new technique, cloning, back in 1997, a very similar sort of attitude. I'm trying to say is what was once regarded by the public as being something un almost unthinkable has now become, uh, in fact, so commonplace. And I took this off uh, the website yesterday. There's a special celebration is going to be held in Hyde Park on the 21st of May to celebrate two million in vitro fertilized, births from in vitro fertilization, two million. Um, and thousands of babies, and this is, uh, this is prenatal diagnosis, whereby the embryo can actually be sampled, biopsy, and certain genetic diseases uh, screened. 
before the pregnancy proceeds. So this, is, uh, uh, this has become, if you like, an almost uh, run-of-the-mill procedure now, used in hundreds of clinics, including in Columbia, uh, in St. Louis, and throughout the state of Missouri. But the question really, uh, the concern here is, uh, to individuals, the production of new human embryonic stem cells, and I'll go back to what embryonic stem cells we have available, will involve the destruction of thousands of human embryos. And again, I'm not going to say this is up to you, I think, to decide in your own minds whether this is an appropriate, um, if you like, fate for these embryos. But I would remind you that every year hundreds of thousands of human embryos are created by in vitro fertilization procedures designed to allow infertile couples to have children. Hundreds of thousands. And to obtain the eggs for in vitro fertilization, the, um, the endoscope, the retrieval of the egg, uh, does not involve just removing one egg. It involves treating the woman with drugs to cause superovulation, so many eggs are produced. And these eggs are then fertilized um, in vitro with uh, the husband's sperm, and that the embryos that look good are the ones that are returned to the mother. In Britain right now, no more than two eggs, uh, no more than two zygotes are returned to the mother. There is still the unfortunate tendency in this country to return multiple ones to enhance the success. But as Patrick Stepto once said, I heard him say this, one of the greatest tragedies of in vitro fertilization is multiple births. But nevertheless, there are always going to be spare embryos. And in general, uh, once uh, these spare embryos are of little interest to uh, the parents, um, and so many more eggs are produced than fert can be used, and so the embryos are usually either discarded, as they have be, are in many states, or now in Missouri, they are frozen indefinitely. And the real question is here, and an ethicist can answer this better than me, what is you know, the status of these embryos? And one question that I I'd like to just have all of you think about is that uh, you have already had your children, but you have some uh, frozen embryos in liquid nitrogen, and you decide you want to keep them at home. You're going to put them down in your basement in liquid nitrogen. And your house starts to burn down. It's on fire, and you're outside the house, and you have two children upstairs asleep, and you have a dog uh, down on the main floor, and you're outside the house. Now, you rush in. Now, what are you going to say first? I think your children. And what are you likely to rescue second? Probably the family dog. My point is, I'm not trying to make value judgments here, but I want you to start thinking about whether an embryo at this stage, uh, consisting of only a few cells, has the same value state as, uh, for example, your children, or even the family dog. I'm not, uh, that's for you to think about. All right, some questions then. The status of human embryonic stem cells are the equivalent of embryos persons. And I think this is something that everybody has to think through. Are there, uh, uh, what are the objections to using these spare embryos? To keep them indefinitely? To throw them down the sink? Uh, are there alternatives to using human embryonic stem cells for tissue replacement? Adult stem cells, possibly. But as I said, the promise of adult stem cells has not lived up quite to the hype uh, that accompanied uh, the initial publications. And can human embryonic stem cells be produced by developing cell lines? And this came up actually with a, a conversation with Phil Peters, who's sitting here, and he asked me, has anyone created a cell line from just biopsying an embryo? After all, we do um, biopsy them. I said on that slide showing the Hyde Park celebration, they are biopsied to uh, screen for genetic disease. So, uh, could we just take a biopsy and grow them? And, and to my knowledge, no one has ever done this. Uh, but it's, I'm sure people are thinking about it, but I certainly haven't seen a report of this in the literature. But I'm not in the uh, business of creating embryonic stem cells, and people who do may know uh, a little better. So there are some issues here, and issues particularly for us in Missouri where there is pending legislation on some, on some areas of this. 
when does life begin? Well, Missouri statutes, or a statute that was in now incorporated into, uh, indicate that human life begins at the moment of conception. Well, um, again, this is something I think you've got to think about, because the sperm and the egg are certainly alive. They have all the characteristics of a living cell. The only difference is they have 23 chromosomes and the embryo has 46, because you get the fusion. But uh, anyone who is a botanist in here will be uh, aware of the so-called alternation of generations. If you look at mosses and liverworts, which are pretty common sort of plants, what you see there, what you see as the green plant, the dominant form of it, is actually the haploid state. Uh, and in fact, the insignificant form uh, that's, uh, uh, is in fact the diploid state. So um, there, are, uh, there are organisms where, in fact, if you like, it's the gametic part that's the real, you know, uh, uh, is, the, uh, is, is the main part of the plant, um, and it's the diploid part which is insignificant. This is not going to win many arguments down in Jefferson City, but I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> um, the transition from an embryo to a baby is also a gradual one. As you know, we're dealing going from a single cell to a few cells. A blastocyst may consist of 120 cells to 10 trillion cells, which make up the adult. And again, uh, should we be dealing with absolutes or should we be thinking about uh, gradation? I don't know. I'm not uh, a, a philosopher could probably come in and talk about this at some length. I'm not going to. Let's talk about some of the federal initiatives that have gone along with this. In 1996, there was, uh, after a lot of humming and hawing, there was a prohibition of federal funds to create, damage, or destroy human embryos. Um, and I think that this was uh, uh, because of the unease at which um, uh, reproductive technologies were advancing. Um, in 1998, um, Thompson at the University of Wisconsin created human embryonic stem cells, but he did it with private funds, and that's still perfectly legal. Industry, individuals who can get private support can still do work on human blastocysts and produce human embryonic stem cells. The problem is that people like myself or uh, other people who work with embryonic stem cells cannot use those cell lines. It would, uh, it would be a felony and I, would be, uh, I could be put into jail for it. So the cell lines, and I'll come to this in a minute, that scientists now use is restricted to just a few. And the Clinton administration did move forward with efforts to fund embryonic stem cell research. But then in 2000, candidate Bush opposed this, so there was a, a, a rift then occurring. And of course, as most of you know, then just over a year later, President Bush allows federal funding to continue on existing cell lines. And that became in itself controversial. Um, one is, you know, uh, the question would be risen, what's really the difference between an existing one, which has certainly risen from a human embryo, and ones that are created, which are using spare embryos. But nevertheless, uh, this is the position as it stands now. But it got more complicated than that, because um, he, uh, at the time, uh, pr the president, who, in all fairness here, was the first person to allow, first president to allow this sort of research. I, as I said, the Clinton administration was certainly moving forward in that direction, but in fact, by the time the uh, uh, election occurred in 2000, uh, the, uh, no one, uh, it was still impermissible to work with even the products of these embryos. But they said there were 64 human embryonic stem cell lines in existence, and it turned out um, this was a, a great exaggeration. I don't think any fault of the president's, it was just he was fed wrong information. And the real question is, are sufficient numbers of embryonic cell cell lines adequate for developing any sort of therapies available that could be carried out using public money? And I want to emphasize public money because um, the one thing I think that I fear and many other people fear is that if all this research is in the private sector, it immediately does not have to be published. It does not have to come under public scrutiny. And I think that the country is much safer having um, openness in science than it is, um, if you like, privatizing some of these, uh, these efforts. Uh, the other question, of course, is that the existing cell lines 
all of them that I know of, um, were in fact developed using mouse cells as feeders. I mentioned this last week. And such cells could not possibly be used for developing therapies because there is the danger of carrying with that, um, of, of carrying with those cells uh, DNA or viruses and other uh, uh, types of, um, shall we say, threat from, uh, to, that might cause a zoonotic uh, disease that or, or, or um, would have somehow altered those cell lines in such a way that it's very unlikely that the FDA would ever approve the use of such cell lines in therapy. And the embryonic stem cell lines of theories have, you know, how do we direct their differentiation efficiently into specific cell types? This require, will require an enormous amount of work. It's not going to be sufficient in therapists to just sort of take a suspension of these cells and inject them into the brain. Uh, these cells will have to be nudged along the direction of the lineage that you're interested in replacing. And how do we differ them efficiently for tissue repair? These are enormous challenges that will require research. And lastly, how do we prevent immune rejection? To go back to the kidney again, uh, we, uh, when kidney transplants are done, even under immune suppression, uh, we always try and choose, or the physician will always try and choose an appropriately matching individual where the differences, genetic differences displayed at the surfaces of the cells and the organ are minimal rather than maximal. And that, in that way, uh, one has the opportunity or less opportunity for rejection to occur. So, um, even, if we ha even if these cell lines, and there are probably only about 22 of them in existence in the world, and not all those are really a sure bet. Even if you had those, you have a very narrow genetic range of material that you could work with if you're going to use tissue replacement in the clinic. And of course, there was show us the cells. And I remember when this came out, and they, you know, the question is, where are all these cell lines? And I can tell you where some of them are. And every time uh, I, when we uh, are from Jamie Thompson at Wisconsin, and the University of Wisconsin and has formed a company up there, and every time you get a vial of cells from them, it costs how much money, Toshi? $5,000. They're not cheap. And they do grow indefinitely, so there's no problem <laughs> to producing lots of them. Um, and this cartoon I was in, th and they're, by the way, they're, they're under protection, so you can't distribute them to anybody else, or you'll, um, uh, you'll end up... Uh, uh, being a criminal, essentially. But uh, again, so, uh, but other than that, how are, how are Bosch's stem cell guidelines affecting your ability to conduct research? And you see the guy here. It's a little unfair because this was the first, uh, this was the first opportunity. I mean, it was a, effectively a compromise. And at least it did make these cell lines available for people to use on public monies. All right, let's just now take a step forward to California Proposition 71. In September 2002, Gray Davis, uh, who was uh, no longer the governor of California, signs a bill allowing therapeutic cloning. And I'll get into therapeutic cloning in a little while. And in 2004, a ballot initiative, uh, I said would, it will now, because we know that ballot initiative passed, would provide an investment of $3 billion over 10 years in bond, a huge investment within a state. Um, it was supported by the Republican governor, and it was passed by a large, surprisingly large majority of voters. So is this a milestone in medical research, or is it a sad sort of reflection of the slippery path towards utilizing and exploiting human embryos? And why was it supported? And I think it was supported because most people could see the utility of stem cell research and possibly stem cell, um, although I think it's overblown, uh, uh, of, st of the value of stem cells in the clinic. Uh, and I think people saw it as a chance for themselves and their children to benefit from medical advances. Because the California voters are going to be paying for this. I mean, that make no, I mean, you know, uh, this is a bond, but they, bonds have to be repaid. Okay, so let's get on to this last kind of therapeutic cloning, creating human embryonic stem cells by somatic nuclear cell transfer, cloning, the dreaded uh, word 
uh, that, uh, it, uh, that really does scare people. And although it's now perfectly legal to use those monies in California, by the way, to do this. Okay, so nuclear transplantation to produce stem cells. What do we mean? Well, you may not be able to read this, but in uh, earlier this year, a group of Korean scientists published a paper in Science in which they transferred nucleus from a somatic cell, a normal tissue cell, placed that in an unfertilized egg from which the existing DNA had been removed, grew up those, formed a blastocyst, and obtained embryonic and embryonic stem cell line. That was earlier this year. And this is what we're really talking about now, uh, something that's, uh, e that is possible. Let's talk about normal reproduction. We get an egg and a sperm, fertilization, an embryo. Uh, this is implanted in the uterus, either by embryo transfer or it occurs naturally within the female. Uh, we get an offspring from it. And this is Dolly, and you've all heard about the late Dolly. Um, and uh, she was cloned, of course, in 1997. Uh, this, uh, and she herself went on to have uh, two, I think, litters of lambs and uh, uh, has, uh, was euthanized, I think, last year, or was it earlier this year? Um, so what is, again, let's emphasize, let's have a look at the difference between what cloning is. Uh, here we have how Dolly was created, who had a black-faced sheep, um, uh, she gave donor eggs, and these were obtained again by that super ovulation process I talked about for human IVF. So we ha now had lots of eggs from several, actually, black-faced sheep. And we had, a, uh, we had a cell line that was derived from a, a white-faced sheep here. So the, donor, uh, the DNA was removed from the donor egg, and this nucleus, diploid nucleus, with the full set of uh, uh, two sets of chromosomes, one, of course, originally from the sheep's father and one from the mother, uh, uh, th w this nucleus was fused into this uh, now empty oocyte. It was, um, uh, it was allowed to develop. It was returned to a, a black-faced sheep. And lo and behold, white-faced dolly was, uh, r r was created. So this is cloning, if you like, in a nutshell. It's very difficult. It took hundreds of nuclear transfers. Uh, it took many potential dolly mothers, and many of the dollies uh, died during pregnancy, and many more actually died after birth. Cloning, I, I, don't, I think anybody who does cloning with farm animals will say they've never actually seen a perfectly normal uh, fetus or a perfectly normal. There are usually something wrong with them. The next generation, if you can breed them, however, are perfectly okay. But cloning is not a perfect uh, technology. Okay, so what we have now then is this technique. We removing, in the case of the human, the uh, nucleus within the oocyte, which has 23 chromosomes, and which would normally be fertilized by a sperm with 23 chromosomes. But instead, we're taking the nucleus out of this somatic cell, we're putting it into this oocyte, we're activating it, which makes the oocyte think it's been fertilized. Um, and then it starts to develop, and we get again one of these blastocysts. We grow up stem cells, and now we have the ability to produce um, stem cells uh, here. Now, the big difference here is that all these cells will have the same genetic constitution of the nucleus that was transferred. So you can see where we're getting at. What we could do for an individual, for example, um, uh, uh, who needed a tissue match, would be to clone that individual, essentially, as far as the blastocyst. In other words, remove a somatic cell nucleus, put it into an egg, uh, create this, allow them to grow, out, and w w uh, lo and behold, we now have stem cells that are genetically identical to the person who donated the nucleus. Nothing to do here with the oocyte. Yeah, uh, it's um, the 
uh, in fact, Dolly was cloned from a, a, a mature, I think, five-year-old you. I mean, an old, uh, but I mean, it could be from a male. I mean, uh, Dolly was a female because the, the donor was a, a female white-faced you. you can so you could use a male or a female. You can create males or females. And you can take those cells from both old individuals and young individuals. There is some indication that it may be easier with very young individuals. Uh, for example, in agriculture, people sometimes use fetal fibroblasts and things like that. But in fact, uh, most data indicate you can do it from just about anything. Sometimes highly differentiated cells like neurons have proved to be difficult to clone. But they ha people have cloned, uh, taken the nucleus from an immunoglobulin-producing white cell, a lymphocyte, which has had all its DNA rearranged to produce antibodies. And the individual, the mouse that was producing that was identical to the lymphocyte from which it came. So you can take even differentiated cells and, uh, and get, a, 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 in that case, a mouse, or a, I mean, in this case, I guess, potentially a human, although uh, I mean, I think all of us hope that that will never happen. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. The question was whether, I, whether we could do it, uh, it was to do with males or females, and to do with age, was it not? The idea was a 30, I don't think the idea, of, I mean, I think the idea of cloning has always been around, of course, because it would seem, you know, why, but no one really knew how to do it. And the idea was, could you only do it from females? And the, the idea is you have to use eggs to do it, but as the nucleus that comes in can be from a male or from a female. So, you know, all the boys in here can be cloned just as easily as the girls, okay? All right, sexual reproduction again. Let's compare them. Egg, sperm, 23, 23, make 46. Nuclear transplantation, remove the egg nucleus, replace it with the somatic cell, 46. We still get a blastocyst. We can still produce stem cells. But the alternative of fate of this embryo, of course, will be to transfer it back to a woman and therefore produce a cloned, uh, a baby, uh, in, uh, in essence, a clone of the, uh, of the donor up here. And this is, of course, what people fear most. Um, so the concern is that nuclear transplantation will be used to clone human babies. Um, and in 19, uh, uh, just before Christmas, I remember, um, two years ago, CloneAid, a company founded by this uh, religious sect, claimed to have produced a cloned child. Well, the uh, uh, baby has never been delivered, and as far as I know, no one ever saw the pregnant mother and as far as I know, they didn't have a competent person who could even come close to doing this very difficult technique. Because let me emphasize what it requires. It requires dozens and dozens, at present, dozens and dozens of donor eggs. And those have to be obtained from a willing participant. Uh, it requires highly technical uh, skills in transferring, denucleating the oocyte and putting in the diploid. And then it requires, and it took Dolly, I can't remember, 300 shots to get Dolly. You need a, a, a virtual army of women who are willing to receive those eggs uh, to see if an, any one of them could get pregnant. So right now, I mean, the very idea of this seemed absurd then, and it seems absurd now, as well as totally unethical. And the, I, I'm not going to go into the ethics of cloning. But I will point out a practical side effect, and that is there has not, in, in my view, ever been a normal clone produced. They have abnormalities uh, uh, that have occurred during development. Some of them severe, some of them not severe. And the majority of them die uh, sometime early in pregnancy. I'm on about farm animals now. Okay, so we've seen this before. So what really we're worried about is this process here. Otherwise, there's very little difference between this and producing embryos for embryonic stem cells this way. Yeah, question. He wants to know why they come out abnormal. They don't come out mutated. It's just that when we develop, we have a whole, uh, if you like, um, there's, there's a whole progression of events that have to occur. 
when you take an adult nucleus and you put it into an egg, it still thinks it's uh, a uh, from a nerve cell or from a skin cell, and it has all the ability to do that. It has to be deprogrammed. And this deprogramming means altering all sorts of uh, uh, features of the DNA. Um, there, are, there are groups on there called methyl groups. Um, there are other alterations, and these have to be done perfectly, or else as the embryo progresses, genes come on at the wrong time. So you get these abnormalities accumulating as the pregnancy proceeds. Is that clear? We don't really have a full understanding of it, but it's almost certainly due to the fact that your DNA is not just simply a string of nucleotides. There are other things sort of fastened onto it, and those have to be removed appropriately to allow the program to, be, uh, to uh, occur normally. And normally, that, much of that occurs in very early embryo and also in the gametes prior to sperm and egg formation. Okay. Um, let's also consider, as long as we don't clone babies, we have no embryonic or fetal development beyond the 200 cell stage. And at this size, we're talking about an embryo that's the size of the tip of a pin. And I don't mean the pin head, I mean the tip of the pin. Um, there is, should be no transfer to the uterus, allowing that embryo to develop further towards becoming a human. And blastocyst or stem cells alone uh, cannot, therefore, I mean, in their own, you can't do this in the, in, in, in the test tube to produce a new individual. So there are some real barriers to doing this, um, and of course there are going to be legal ones. I think there's a second concern which we have to be concerned about here, even if we're just going to make embryonic stem cells, and that is human egg donors will be exploited. Um, in order to, uh, when I talked about the Korean group, uh, that earlier this year reported in Science that they produced embryonic stem cells after cloning or after somatic nuclear transfer. They had actually used over 200 human eggs. It then turned out that many of those eggs were obtained from technicians in the laboratory. And the question arose is whether these individuals were in some way coerced uh, unethically into doing this, uh, pressured. I mean, donating eggs is not trivial. Uh, as I said, we have this process of superovulation. It requires taking drugs. It requires retrieval of those eggs. And so the individual who is donating them um, is actually going through an ordeal. If we're going to do somatic nuclear transfer, clearly um, things have to improve in terms of doing this efficiently. Uh, we do not want egg farming, and egg farming here involving uh, women. So, um, th I'll close really by just a few other things. It turns out that embryonic stem cells themselves might be capable of forming eggs, or things that look like eggs, and actually going through meiosis and so on. So if, they, if you could get embryonic stem cells, if you remember that tree I showed at the beginning, there was a little branch to the side with green leaves on it. But that is where we go to, through the next, to the next generation. So if you can form, if you can get the embryonic stem cells to go along that branch and form eggs and sperm, um, it might be possible um, to create eggs, enucleate them, and use those as the uh, recipients of, uh, for nuclear transfer. Okay, so we create our own eggs. We don't bring any longer in, uh, women donors into this situation. And clearly, uh, this is now feasible, and um, this work was um, Hans Schoeller, who at the time was at the U Un University, um, University of Pennsylvania in the veter veterinary school. Now he's gone, now returned back to Europe, but he reported this in Science uh, just over a year ago. And since then, there's also been the report of actually producing sperm from embryonic stem cells. Um, I also uh, just like to, again, emphasize that support by the federal government is really quite modest in this area. And uh, uh, 190 million spent on our, we're talking now about a $28 billion budget at National Institutes of Health, at 25 million only on human embryonic cell stem cell research. Uh, again, using only approved lines, and there is still, uh, in the federal statutes, there is no uh, provision for therapeutic cloning. 
But then again, the California Initiative, uh, which, if you like, has flown in the face of the more restrictive policies uh, of the federal government. And uh, again, I won't go into, there. Uh, all I'm saying is that this is an area which is very complicated in terms of legislation. 2001, the House prohibits human nuclear transplantation research. So this would include not just cloning a, a baby, but producing stem cell lines. It also, interestingly enough, the importation of products derived from nuclear transplantation. Not quite certain what that means, uh, except I guess it means you can't, couldn't bring in a cell line from abroad, or um, you could not, uh, in essence, uh, if you like, make use of, uh, of, of opportunities, say in Europe, where, where the, the which tends, uh, particularly in Britain, uh, where it tends to be rather more liberal attitude towards this. Um, there was a companion bill at the time introduced by Senator Brownback from uh, Kansas, so the Senate g side got into this. Um, there is presently, a, uh, there is a, uh, there's a proposed moratorium on this type of research. And then the, uh, uh, the President's Council on Bioethics, which itself has been a very divided body, in fact resulting in one very well-known scientist, Elizabeth Blackburn, being kicked off that committee, um, did uh, 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 propose a four-year moratorium. But in other words, um, and none of these, uh, neither the Brambach bill uh, ha, uh, has passed in the Senate, and neither has the competing bill, uh, which uh, was introduced by Senators Feinstein and Kennedy with Hatch as a co-sponsor, which bans human reproductive cloning, in other words, producing babies, but would permit nuclear transplantation to produce human stem cells. And so the issues of stem cells and therapeutic cloning are unlikely to disappear, and thank you for your attention. Uh, one last word, um, uh, there are similar bills uh, sort of surfacing in Missouri and have been for the last two years and it's unclear what's going to happen there. Um, but certainly uh, it, it is important that those bills um, be uh, worded wisely uh, so that uh, the state of Missouri does not get uh, itself into a lot of trouble by a hastily conceived language in a bill. Um, you might want to say something about that, Phil. No, it doesn't. Um, but there are, uh, shall we say, that, that this is not just a federal issue, this is a state issue as well. And it's thing, this is one reason why I wanted to give these talks, not so much to be a proponent one way or the other, but to make sure that at least some people understand the issues here in terms of the science because I'm afraid that what's going on more and more is that the people who are making legislation the people in some cases who were advising that, those legislation and some of the people who were operating, for example, on behalf of institutions in the state themselves uh, do not understand the issues. So thank you. And if any of you really, I, I won't be insulted if you leave. Um, so, you know, yeah. Let yeah, um, the question was, if we're going to use therapeutic cloning, uh, from uh, and try and get a match with the uh, individual who's affected, you're trying to get some stem cells that would improve them, um, uh, wouldn't this be a problem? Sure it would, yeah, because you would be just propagating the same problem. In this case, you would be obliged to go to a cell in which, uh, uh, go to a, a donor in which the, uh, the, this disease, if you like, this genetic thing, was not evident and therefore uh, provide a replacement. Yeah as with transplants, so it would require immune, uh, it would require immune uh, suppression. So, yeah, sorry, she was, yeah. Uh, 
federal and state legislation, the um, certainly the uh, some of the it depends how the how the how the bill is framed. In in this state, uh, I, it would, as far as I know, ban both private and federal. Um, for example, if therapeutic cloning were made illegal, um, I think that would I think the intent there would be to prevent any possibility of reproductive cloning occurring as a result of that. Um, that's my understanding. So the question is, um, you know, does th is this going to just affect private, uh, uh, or I mean, fe just sort of state or, or, or federally supported research? Uh, it depends on the bill. But my understanding of many of these bills that would ban uh, therapy, it would ban it at all levels. And of course, the danger in, in somewhere like Missouri, when it's clearly been approved by the voters in California, that everything migrates to California. Question in the back there. Is fertilization necessary for cloning? Is fertilization necessary for cloning? In fact, when we clone, uh, when we clone an embryo, uh, we don't fertilize the egg. Uh, what we remove is just the haploid. The, in the case of the human, it would be the 23 uh, chromosome nucleus of the egg. In fact, um, I think at one time everybody thought you would fertilize the egg, then remove the uh, gamete, I mean the, uh, the, the, the nucleus that was there, it would now be diploid, and put your diploid of uh, nucleus back. But in fact, that doesn't work. So the only way that cloning has worked so far is to actually use unfertilized eggs. Uh, how do you obtain the embryonic stem cells from aborted fetuses? Um, aborted fetus, they, they, one, they're, it, they're the cells that become the eggs and become the sperm. So how do you obtain embryonic stem cell from aborted fetuses? The, um, the, the precursor cells of the uh, sperm and the egg uh, are, um, uh, migrate very early in development and uh, sort of to a certain point in the so-called neural crest area and then they form that the uh, gonads form at that point, and then ultimately you get a production of sperm and eggs, uh, or of, uh, of haploid, that's where meiosis occurs. The trick is to get those, uh, those cells before, uh, uh, get those cells and to put them into culture. And so uh, what would happen here is they, they would have to be obtained essentially from an aborted fetuses by dissecting out that region and allowing those cells to grow out. Multipotent stem cells can be differentiated for different cell types? Um, multipotent stem cells that would be the certain types of adult stem cells, for example, in the bone marrow, uh, yeah, they can definitely differentiate or are thought to be able to differentiate into multiple cell types. There have been reports, for example, of using bone marrow stem cells, putting them into a mouse and uh, that's got uh, ischemic damage in the heart and getting an improvement there and what was thought to be formation of muscle cells in the heart. So and it turns out that that's probably incorrect. But uh, so. So what are the differences between multipotent and pluripotent? Pluripotent means that these cells, I mean, by definition, the uh, cells of the blastocyst in the inner cell mass are pluripotent because they're going to give rise to everything. Well, potentially everyone has known that they could do that because we get babies. Okay, but the fact is, if you grow those cells out, they grow into multi. I mean, uh, uh, they grow into an amazing number of cell types, depending upon how you, uh, how, uh, what hormones, what growth factors you put on them. So it's thought that they can produce, even in the culture dish, potentially can produce just about every cell type in the human body. I, I'm hoping that I, I mean, I'm not sure if I understand what you're saying, so I'll ask, but I know there's been a lot of public outcry against abortion and also against stem cell research, but you don't hear anyone um, um, saying anything about in vitro fertilization. So I'm wondering if I understood you right. If you're opposed to embryonic stem cell research on moral grounds, do you also have to be, by inference, opposed to in vitro fertilization? Well, I've tried not to take a position on this. Um, 
Uh, I, I, don't th I think they're two different things. In, in vitro fertilization is used to create a baby. Um, and of course, what, we, what the researchers would do here would be to take an embryo that, that potentially could become a baby and use it in a utilitarian way to produce cells. So I don't think that if you're opposed to, um, uh, if you're opposed to embryonic stem cell research, you're necessarily uh, 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 opposed to, by or logically opposed to in vitro fertilization. What I would say, however, is that the outcry that occurred in the late 70s against in vitro fertilization um, and back in the 50s on artificial insemination was very nearly as great as what we're hearing now. And I guess people here saying, aha, the slippery slope. We get used to these things. We're accepting what are really terrible technologies. We're meddling with life. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, Dolly's accepted, you know, animals are cloned all the time now. They've not turned out to be very useful, but they've, they've been cloned all the time. Um, and so I think people do get used to things, and therefore being used to something doesn't necessarily make it right. Uh, and, and so I don't really want to get into that. I'm not really qualified to talk about issues like that. But I think people do have a point that one can grow into acceptance of something, and that something may not be um, ethically correct. Is it just oh, you are. Um, I was wondering if why don't you just use mouse or rat stem cells instead of human? Uh, the question is why not use, and it's a good question. Uh, the only thing is that, that uh, we, uh, uh, if, if you tried, let, 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 let's say we took a mouse, or let's take a pig, which is bigger, and we take a pig kidney and we graft it into a human, there are some terrible problems with it because it, it, y your body wouldn't like it. In other words, the further apart we are, and a mouse would be even worse, I, I think that uh, if we tried to do anything with those cells, they would probably be rejected. The rest of your body wouldn't like them and would sort of kick them out. Yeah, that's right. Just, um, yeah, I'll just let this one go here. All right. Yeah. Um, when a pregnant person like freezes the blood from their placenta or umbilical cord, yes. Um, are they using embryonic stem cells or adult cells? And what's the advantages and disadvantages of the practice? Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, adult, I mean, uh, cord, uh, cord cells, including, uh, uh, there, uh, there appears to be, they appear to have multipotent promise. In other words, there appear, at least in the, in, in, in the culture dish, do have this ability to possibly differentiate. So that by keeping those cord cells uh, from your baby, uh, you would have a chance sometime down the line uh, to um, use those cells for tissue replacement when our techniques get better, when we know more about what's going on. So I guess in that sense, there's a prudency to it. But there's also, I think, a chance of exploitation. I mean, it's like Ted Williams, the baseball player, having his body frozen in liquid nitrogen. It it really wasn't a great deal of advantage to Ted Williams, who was dead. Um, uh, but in this case, there is the opportunity. But there is also, I think, the, ch the chance here of, uh, of some exploitation. Yeah. Grips with um, whether to accept the use of blastocysts. Um, I'd kind of like to know, in a normal in utero fertilization, just normal sexuality for a, a normal, healthy woman, how often is the blastocyst rejected naturally by nature or passed through without, you know, implanting on the uterine wall? Yeah. The question is, um, how many, how many um, fertilized embryos fail in any case? And the, this is a difficult estimate, but uh, humans are not, uh, 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 we're a fertile in that we produce a lot of people, but we're infertile in that we don't seem to be all that efficient at producing babies when we want. Um, you know, if you had a if you had a sheep that didn't get pregnant every year, you'd send it to market. Um, <laughs> the uh, humans uh, uh, are really not all that fertile, and it has been estimated. I've seen some accounts 
uh, uh, where as much as many as six, uh, 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 many as sixty percent of embryos that are actually living at the time implantation begins don't survive, and there are a variety of reasons for this. Um, uh, uh, the humans also pretty good at filtering out things that are not don't look too good to it. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the so there are multiple reasons for this, but yeah, uh, probably um, the majority even of embryos that are formed naturally may not give rise to a pregnancy. Yeah. Um. Um, when you were talking about alternatives to human stem cell use for tissue replacement, uh, are you talking about like xenotransplantation as the alternatives? Is that the research going on here, or is that research just going on over at Animal Science Research Center? <laughs> uh, there is a xenotransplantation is an attempt to use species uh, like the pig um, by um, uh, or the mouse, um, but to, uh, uh, as you know, to d modify. The actually, they're derived from clones, um, and uh, the idea is to genetically manipulate those until you've got an organ that is not going to be rejected easily in the human. Certainly for whole organs, um, I, I don't think that, there, that embryonic stem cell research has that much of a possible. We're not going to be able to grow a whole organ in culture. We're so, I mean, uh, th that's so far beyond, you know, our imagination uh, that it's unlikely. And therefore, I think xenotransplantation research will certainly continue. Whether it will ever become real is another matter. I mean, again, there's a lot of hype associated with this. Um, so, uh, there, so I think that what will happen here is that it's sort of bits of an organ that are damaged, bit of the heart, part of the brain, um, perhaps uh, putting something into a kidney so it becomes more functional, more functioning cells are there. But I think we're always going to be working within the framework of the existing organ with the embryonic stem cells. I've got two questions. Um, probably not, um, but that, that might, that is certainly a possibility. There are going to be, in a sense, incompatibilities there. Um, but when you think, you know, for the most part, we're fairly similar at the mitochondrial DNA level, and both males and females and different individuals. Um, so there's a, you know, there isn't a lot of DNA in there. I mean, I think the question will come if you try to use, for example, cow eggs or pig eggs instead of uh, human eggs to put that nucleus in and hoped you'd get a human embryo. There you would have mitochondria from the pig or the cow that would have to be carried through to adulthood. And that's where things get really difficult. And, and the second one was uh, when somatic cells are uh, transplanted in there, um, what about the, uh, I remember some research on the telomeres uh, shortening, and that's one of the causes of the, uh, the, or the deformities. Um, I'm not sure telomeres have ever been implicated in the abnormalities. Telomeres have been, uh, it's still an open issue by the way, but telomeres, in other words, if you take a nucleus from an old animal, do you get, are you going to get an old cell? And uh, there is mixed evidence on this and it may well depend upon the cell type. The telomeres are the ends of the chromosomes and they have to be renewed or the chromosome will get progressively shorter. Um, uh, I don't think, I mean, for just replacing cells, it may not be a big issue. And I say it's still a controversial area in any case. Yeah. And to rephrase the uh, ethical question in front of us as uh, this has been presented, I think we all agree that uh, uh, a fetus uh, that is a uh, month from delivery, two months from delivery is an individual. The court case uh, yesterday in California uh, resulted in second degree murder of that, uh, uh, of Connor, basically. Uh, then the question is, is where along the line, where on that path do we say the individual has developed? Um, and I think it's important to understand that a uh, segment of uh, our society views that unique event to be when those 23 and 23 chromosomes got together and created um, uh, the uh, embryo basically. Um, 
And, but the other side of the argument is, of course, well, that's fine, but in processes that we have accepted, like in vitro fertilization, there are a lot of those uh, uh, that uh, we destroy or maybe uh, by law have to store. And cannot we use that uh, uh, tissue uh, for benefit for people who have uh, very severe neurologic diseases that we all might get at some point in time, even when we're young, such as spinal injury or head injury, or when we're older, Parkinson's disease. It's not, a, it's not an easy uh, decision at all, I think. And uh, um, so anyway, I appreciate uh, your laying out the biology behind it. I mean, this is, a, this, this is an area where I get uncomfortable because clearly there is a transition and in Britain in the, in the 70s, no, in the 80s, I'm trying to figure out when it was. I've, I've lived in the States for 40 years, so I'm not talking about my British background particularly here. But the, the, there was a report before Parliament uh, that was generally uh, uh, honoured and that would allow embryos to be used as for research up to about 14 days. And the reason that 14 days was chosen is this, at the, this is the point where one starts to get, begin to get differentiation into tissues and organs in the fetus proper. And of course, within a few days, you have to have a heartbeat. Now, you need that heartbeat because you've got to circulate things through the embryo. I mean, you know, it's not surprising the, trophy, the placenta forms first, in a sense, the heart forms second, because these are the things that are required to drive uh, the uh, embryo through pregnancy. But the argument was, well, you know, you don't really have an individual until you start to get differentiation. I'm not sure I accept that particular argument either. It seems to me that what we have is a gradation. And at some time to other, just as in Roe versus Wade, it really um, uh, uh, obviously favored the first trimester over subsequent trimesters. Uh, this to me is in a perfectly appropriate way to approach things. That there aren't really absolutes here, and we've got to be very careful. Yeah. Uh, I just have a question about the ethics behind it. I think with the Human Genome Project, with the funding, they set aside like 3% of the funding for, you know, the study of the ethics. Is there, do they set aside a certain amount of money to study the ethics, or do you think there should be? Uh, the question is, is there sufficient money sp spent on ethical issues? I could give you my own prejudice view, is that there are so many ethicists around right now who, uh, uh, who, who sort of talk about these rather narrow subjects. I think we, what it requires is a great deal of thought and a great deal of public education and, uh, and, and, and some sort of, um, I, I guess, clear um, ethical mandate one way or the other. But uh, my own view is that uh, uh, there is sufficient money spent on ethics. But that's my view. I'm sure you feel differently, Phil. I just wanted to say thank you for such an informative uh, lecture. And I'm thinking of writing to my senators and congressmen. I don't know whether I should start in the state of Missouri or the U.S. people. I want to word my letter wisely like I would want them to word the uh, laws that they make wisely. So do you have any ideas of how to start this letter? Well, I'm not here as a, a political <laughs> advocate. That is the last thing I want to do. I mean, let me put it this way. My, my, I'm not a physician. Um, my, I am a researcher. I'm interested in the formation of the placenta, and I happen to use one line of human embryonic stem cells to do this. And Dr. Azashi here is my partner in crime, so to speak, in this. Um, it probably will make little difference to me personally as to what happens in Missouri. It's very unlikely um, that it's going to have any impact on me. On the other hand, uh, I think it's up to different people um, if they feel strongly enough about it to uh, work with the, the legislator. I mean, my concern is not so much that people have views. I just want their, those views to be educated views and not views that are mistaken. And unfortunately, as I said, many of the people uh, who are stepping up to the plate to make these laws uh, really don't understand the issues themselves. And many of the people lobbying for the other way don't understand the issues very well. So that's really my point. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it's very difficult for the University of Missouri to put itself into the position of an advocate in these situations. We very much depend on the public purse. We depend upon the support of, build of this sort of building and this campus upon the goodwill of legislators. And it, 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 if, if the University of Missouri becomes a very strong proponent one way or the other of this, uh, I think that you're uh, uh, endangering the support to your institution. Um, and I think that's why the private, um, the WashU, um, the Stowers Institute, and the Stowers are threatening to pull out of Missouri if in fact some of this legislation passes. But these are the ones that are really going to have to carry the standard here, plus the general public. The university or me or myself cannot take a position on it, nor would I choose to do so in a very public way. I don't mind giving this sort of lecture, but I'm not going down to lobby on this. So as a citizen, maybe I could, uh, the importance of the economic development in Missouri versus California, or the economic development of the U.S. of A versus Korea, Brits, and even Australians, maybe. Yeah, I mean, if you think it is an economic issue, um, I mean, certainly economic issues tend to play well, but, I mean, there is a lot of emotion in all this, and you have to understand that um, uh, when you get into this area. I have really no, you know, I've really no view on this, but certainly, and again, I don't know the law of Missouri <laughs> well enough to be able to tell you what it is precisely here. But certainly, of course, what has happened in California with the guilty yesterday, which occurred on Friday afternoon, as everyone predicted it would, um, uh, indicated there that there, this is a dual murder. Uh, I suspect it would apply in Missouri as well, but I really don't know. You said on the, the stem cell uh, lives are contaminated by my cells. Um, so I can look at it two ways. Either you're against this research, in which case it shouldn't be funded at all. Or since they're all contaminated, why bother funding them? Is, is there really, are you only learning techniques you could learn from rat cells? Um, the, the, the question is whether in fact we could really do this research just as easily on rodent cell lines. The odd thing is you can't. Human stem cells are incredibly different from mouse stem cells. Um, having, uh, they, they just behave differently. They respond to different sorts of cues in culture. They differentiate under different conditions. I don't think that you're going to ever be able to think about using human cells therapeutically until you know how to work, how to nudge those human cells in particular directions. And the other thing is these cell lines do have enormous value, uh, of course. I mean, we have different genes in mouse. The development of the placenta is different in the mouse than in the human. And so, there are, I mean, there are just basic, good basic science reasons for using these cells. Um, so uh, my, my point is that there is something unique about each. Uh, em embryonic stem cell lines, even in the human, differ from each other. I mean, th this in the mouse, we know that some of them, for example, we're always worried about germline, tr uh, germline transmission. Is that is, if we can get them into a, a mouse, and I, I should have shown you my last slide, but uh, do they do they actually will they actually form the gonads? Will they form these? Uh, uh, will they allow you to pass on? The, 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 can you use those cells to pass genes on to future directions? Then they differ. So different cell lines differ. Human cell lines certainly differ from rodent. And the, uh, the opportunities, I think, for if you're ever going to contemplate that these will be used clinically, you have to have human cell lines to do that. And you can still learn a lot from the ones that uh, may not be ever used because they've had rodent contamination, probably from viral particles and so on. But you can still use those in culture and do most of the experiments you need. You don't need necessarily 
you know, 500 cell lines, 1,000 cell lines to do that. But you will need those cell lines if you're ever going to contemplate using them therapeutically. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, could you define what a stem cell line is? Is it 64 different original stem cells? Or is it no, a stem cell line, all cell lines are essentially uh, cells that have been cultivated usually from one or a few number of cells. And so they're all genetically, phenotypically identical. Um, in fact, that rarely happens. They do tend to differentiate. But so cell lines are just something that you derive from a small number of cells. And because ES cells continue dividing indefinitely, you can actually produce as many. But that will always be the same cell line, even if it's in 50 different laboratories all over the world. Let's uh, thank uh, Professor Roberts once more.